This conference will now be recorded. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Irene. Hello. Uh, I can see that uh, we are already eight, so I suggest that uh, we wait five more minutes for the challenge champions to connect, and then uh, I will start uh, the meeting. I will begin with the introduction. Okay, so we're waiting five more minutes, and then we will begin. Thank you. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, hello. Um, let's uh, start the meeting. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Open Air Advance team, I would like to welcome you to this uh, debate session. The aim of the session is to give you an overview of the three Open Air challenges, to explain to you certain technical characteristics and to answer to you questions related to possible technical or um, strategic issues. Uh, my name is uh, Irini Karachristou. Uh, today we'll manage the discussion so as to be in line with our timeline. So, uh, since I presented to you the scope of our meeting, uh, we will start with a presentation. Um, I believe that you can see the second slide, the agenda. And um, what, uh, how we're going to proceed um, after the scope of the meeting that we discussed already and the open air advanced long term strategy. At the second stage, we will proceed with the presentation of the challenges. Uh, so we have um, our challenge champions here that they will proceed with the presentations. Uh, last, but um, not least after the the challenges uh, we will listen to additional comments by the challenge champions and then in order to conclude the session um i will give you an overall framework of of the open air pcp call for tender and um, the annexes related uh to the call the meeting will be completed with a roundtable discussion where you as uh, participants can address any question related to technical and uh, strategic issues. So uh, if uh, there aren't already some questions important as far as the, the, the overall administration of the meeting is concerned, uh, I can uh, leave uh, the floor to the first um, a presenter, Mrs. Uh, Natalia Manola. Uh, she's a research associate at uh, the Athena Research Center, Research and Innovation Center. Uh, she will present to us the Open Air Advanced Long Term Strategy. So, um, thank you from my side. And um, Natalia, we are ready to hear you. Hello, hello everyone, and thanks for joining uh, this call. Uh, can you make me presenter, Irini? Yes, of course. One minute. Okay. okay. Um, so now you can see it, okay? Yeah. Okay. So I will go very briefly because, you know, may, I think I, I assume uh, that quite a few of you know of open air all these years. So I will go briefly and say what we aim to do with this open call and why we're doing that. So this is open air. This is a, a key initiative on open science in Europe. And Open Air Advance is the fourth uh, project in a row uh, funded by the European Commission. Uh, let me see. So in a nutshell, open air, uh, we are doing uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to build and operate an infrastructure about open and reproducible science, um, uh, nailing down around the scientific scholarly communication. And we have two branches. One is an IT uh, branch, which we provide services, and Paolo will probably explain a lot about it, but also to uh, engage with key experts around Europe uh, as we believe that uh, open science cannot happen to, without help. So this is about uh, a, a data infrastructure, 
about services, content, whatever content or research outcomes it is, and it's about interoperability and linking things together. Uh, and many of you have, may have heard about the European Open Science Cloud, which is a key initiative in Europe um, on how, how we can provide uh, a seamless, um, a seamless uh, environment as much as possible for researchers to do their research. Okay? And in open air, I'm not going to go briefly about it, but we are. Uh, I'm going to go in length about it. But we are a consortium of 50, around 50 partners, uh, experts from open science, uh, legal experts, infrastructure providers, IT, um, our open innovation colleagues here, and uh, we have also some um, participants who are doing uh, citizen science. But again, it's about open science experts, IT providers, data community, legal experts. Our key characteristics is that OpenAir is a oops, I'm sorry, uh, is a distributed and participatory infrastructure, meaning that what we are aiming to do is to connect all different actors across Europe. And we started from open access to publications, and this uh, still remains one of our cores. But we're moving slowly to a holistic view of open science. It's based open air as an infrastructure is uh, we know that each level of the infrastructure has different uh, each infrastructure has different layers. Uh, open air is based on existing initiatives, national or institutional initiatives. And what I would like to say here and stress this is the repositories is of key are of key importance to open air because these are uh, publicly owned um, um, uh, services and uh, as we are building an open infrastructure of course we would allow we want to allow SMEs and uh, and companies and commercial um, uh, uh, commercial companies commercial entities to be involved and this is why we have the open innovation but it has to be on the principles of open science and uh, the third key characteristics is that we support all types of research outcomes, not only publication. Uh, and we want to have what we call the linked open science, um, the linked open science idea. Three pillars of action. We, um, we work on policies, on training, and on services. This is what Open Air does. We have three main pillars, and the 50 uh, consortium members are working on these areas. And the policies can be on the national level, or you know, when we're trickling down to the institutions, or um, uh, to the research infrastructures. Same for training, same for services. How we operate, uh, we um, we work on three, uh, we have three uh, different levels of operation. National uh, approach is our key approach. Then we are um, in Europe, we are um, approaching uh, thematic research infrastructures, meaning that if you have uh, research infrastructure or a specific domain, let's say social sciences or humanities. We work with them because they are very well organized across countries, uh, across country in, in Europe. And then, of course, we have the global alignment. Uh, we have services for all stakeholders, and I have here the B2C, B2Client, Business Client, Business to Business, and, uh, and how we see our views. So if you think about researchers as clients or funders or providers as clients, we have the support at the low level where we're trying to reach uh, researchers and scientists. We have four services here. Uh, one is Zenodo, which is a, a, a repository uh, hosted by CERN and uh, co-funded by CERN and OpenAir. Uh, Amnesia, which is a, a service for anonymization data. And now we're in the process of uh, developing a data management plan service. And of course, and those are the three IT services that we have for our researchers. But we also have a pan-European help desk and training um, uh, distributed uh, service. The next level is the B2B, is uh, we are targeting the content providers where we have four services. Uh, Skull Explorer is one service, which is data to literature and data to data um, uh, links. 
Uh, the interoperability guidelines, we have the validation, people register in open air, the content providers register, we have the interoperability guidelines, and we validate and register them uh, through these. We have the usage analytics and the open access broker. I think Paolo will go more into detail. And then we have the value added services based on what we uh, do, which is about research analytics, uh, monitoring dashboard and APIs. And in a nutshell, you know, this is this is what we do on OpenAir. And my final slide is uh, we have uh, on the technical side because we're not going to go into the training and uh, the support and help desk. We have uh, uh, a few strategic priorities. So the overall strategic priority is to change scholarly communication towards openness. And what we believe is that there are services for all stakeholders. So how you know scholarly communication involves researchers, involves institutions, publishers, uh, data sources, content providers, funders, policymakers. What we believe is that open air and, and open scholarly communication like open air should have services targeting um, any of these uh, stakeholders. Then what we find out uh, is that even though we are talking about open science, researchers really uh, have a problem in taking it up. And we believe that one of the reasons is that there are no need services for them to take it up. So we're looking for innovative ways of engaging researchers in open services through need services, uh, in open science through need services. Uh, other strategic priority is interoperability. So because content providers is a key stakeholder for us is, and we are talking about a seamless access and seamless integration or you know any, any buzzword that we can think of, interoperability is of key. We do not want silos. So how do we have uh, services that um, allow us to, to, um, to go towards a, a seamless space? And then once we have open, open science and open access publications, data, software, whatever, is how can you enable some intelligent and contextual discovery? And this is uh, one of the things that uh, is coming, um, uh, is, is around the corner especially with artificial intelligence and the buzz that is going about it. Uh, and the two other strategic priorities that we have is uh, monitoring and interactive visualization, because monitoring now targeting funders, funders and policymakers is that they are giving a lot of money to open science, but how, how are they uh, willing, uh, you know, what are the commitments that they are able to put in this open science uh, re, um, relies a lot on how uh, their policy uh, goes along. So monitoring is, uh, is very is key to them. And of course, as we are creating this, uh, this huge graph of uh, millions and millions of records uh, all linked together, is we need to uh, have services that embed quality in this uh, open air graph and the processes behind it. And this was the last slide. And what I wanted to say is that we have this open innovation call. One of the reasons is that open air, until now, we get our funding through um, the Commission, so through, through the European Commission, through project funds. And it's very hard for us every time to include new partners or new services because we are getting paid for operations. So we're trying to find a way where through these open calls, we are including uh, players and, and innovative players who can participate in the shaping up of this infrastructure in a way that they can commit but they also, you know, um, they can start of thinking of business models and uh, ways of uh, having sustainable services uh, which go beyond uh, project money. And I think this is all I wanted to say for the moment. Thank you very much, um, Natalia, for your presentation. Um, okay, in order to be in line with the agenda, I believe that uh, we can proceed to the presentation of the challenges and uh, if the participants have already taken some notes, they can address their questions at the end of um, the overall presentation. So, if um, 
I'm correct, that we will start with challenge two and three uh, in order to give the floor to Mr. Paolo Manchi uh, because he has to leave earlier. If is this the case, if this is the case, then um, uh, I can uh, make you presenter and uh, we can start with the presentation of the challenge two. We can cannot hear, hear Paolo. Oh. Can you hear me now? Can you see the slides? Yes, uh, personally I can see the slides and I can hear you perfectly. Okay, so thank you all for coming and thanks Natalia for the introduction. Uh, I will just follow up with challenge two and challenge three. So the idea is um, to present the technical uh, layers that we've been building in open air in the last 10 years. Uh, I'll just go through them uh, quickly so it's like a view from the moon but you can stop me anytime I think also you can also write questions just in case uh, I'm not going into enough details for you to answer such questions some questions okay um, so first of all uh, this is not working first of all yes okay let me uh, first uh, give you an idea of what we've been doing so um, the focus of open air has been uh, for a long time the the one of uh, monitoring uh, how scholarly communication is performing basically so the um, is it's about grabbing aggregating metadata about scientific products uh, collected worldwide from uh, thousands tens of thousands of sources and um, in order to be able to um, uh, monitor how the uh, open access and non-open access trends across uh, uh, science are doing, are performing. The original question came from the funders, uh, especially the Commission, who wanted to uh, monitor and supervise the effect of the open access mandates on the scientific community. So since then things have changed, open science uh, uh, came over and took over in fact so the, the space uh, of interest uh, for us and for the scientists moved not only to uh, fr not was um, not only focused on scientific publications but also to other kinds of scientific products like data like software and so on so open air followed up uh, and uh, along this line we developed services that are now collecting metadata about all these kind of products so on the one hand uh, we are trying to collect everything that is uh, trustful enough, um, so let's say endorsed by the communities and by the scientists, um, in terms of metadata and build the connections between these objects. So we try to connect uh, publications to data, publications to software, or, or, or collect links uh, among these uh, products when they exist and they're provided by the original sources and by the scientists. On the other hand, we also uh, look at the other side of the moon since our main customers were the scientists in the beginning together with the organization the, the funders only uh, together with the organizations we are also collecting information about funders uh, at the national level european level but also uh, across the oceans that we uh, we have around europe so we uh, have funders from uh, australia from the us and uh, from several nations in uh, in europe uh, so we also do our best to collect information about their projects at the granularity level of the project so that we can glue uh, the uh, funding efforts so the projects themselves and the grants with the results uh, of such efforts such efforts uh, so we're basically building a graph uh, the graph that natalia has mentioned before that uh, serves can serve both scientists on the one hand to publish science in an open science fa fashion so uh, 
all digital products interconnected, but it can also serve uh, um, funders and their officers and institutions in monitoring how science is doing and the, for example, the research impact of their uh, uh, their efforts. So if you look at a picture at the bottom, you have an idea of the kind of sources we are collecting from, which range from publication repositories, data repos data repositories, or registries of information like, of information like uh, ORCID for the authors or uh, uh, grid.ac for the institutions. These are databases that contain uh, identifiers and information regarding uh, uh, key entities in the scholarly communication domain, like uh, again uh, authors and institutions, but also we collect from software repositories and several others, um, publishers and so on. Um, we try to impose as much as possible what we call guidelines, and this will probably be treated in the challenge one. Uh, but we have guidelines which are basically instructions uh, on how to export the metadata about the scientific products, uh, which should be. Um, uh, acquired by the content providers and uh, implemented by them in order to align as much as, as possible the scientific production. And these uh, actually took uh, over quite well in Europe and beyond, uh, especially on the side of publication repositories. Uh, several platforms are today implementing uh, the open air guidelines. So we can count at least on a very, on a first level of uh, homogeneity. But we're also collecting from what we call research infrastructures. These are uh, huge investments from the Commission, uh, which are today, which is today investing in the communities so that they can develop their own thematic services, digital services to perform science in a specific community. Even there, we collect metadata about objects and we include them in our graph. For example, uh, virtual appliances, um, virtual machines in general, which are described as scientific products representing, for example, an experiment, so software and data together, and, and so on. Now, when we collect those objects, we build the graph that you see uh, drawn here, uh, drew here. Of course, it's uh, a very high level view. Uh, for the data model, you have to rely on the documents we've published on, uh, in Zenodo. You can find them there. And we perform a number of actions from harvesting to uh, uh, cleaning. So basically, harmonizations of the metadata to converge to a common um, uh, data model, the, the open air data model. Uh, we de duplicate uh, those objects and so on. And we are also brokering information around. Uh, this means that when it is possible, since we know where each piece of information comes from, for example, a record from a given repository, uh, if we uh, if we can perform any action that enriches this record, we can uh, provide information back to the original source so that they can reach locally uh, the information. Uh, on top of this information space that we build, uh, we have several APIs, several kinds of standard APIs that people can use, uh, but we also use to provide the services that you see on the left connect, explore, provide, develop, and monitor, which are uh, devised to serve specific kinds of customers that you can see written there. I'll try to go into the detail later on. Now, I want to um, tell you a little bit that we're just going one layer down, which is not enough to get your hands into the code, but that gives you an idea. We have five subsystems in, in OpenAir. Uh, one, uh, a key one is on the, mm, uh, bottom left corner is the aggregation subsystem. Uh, from from here, we built a number of services that allow uh, a team of people to uh, include new data sources in the aggregation process, collect the metadata, transform and clean the metadata. So we have this uh, separation between uh, na native records and transformed records. We can also collect the files, so the PDFs. We are today reaching around 10 million PDFs. Uh, we extract the full text from this PDF. And uh, on the right, you see the information inference subsystem. This is where we perform mining algori algorithms or over and text mining over the files uh, in order to find information that is not available in the original metadata. And this goes down especially to links, links between publications and data sets, publications and projects, publications and software, and so on. This is actually one of the uh, real added value of OpenAI today, especially in terms of, mo of monitoring. Uh, links are not often there, they are within the text, but not in the metadata, and we uh, uh, factor them out and put them in the graph. Then we have this uh, 
data provision subsystem, which is the place where we manifest, we generate the graph for the first time. Uh, the graph is stored uh, in an HDFS, actually in an HBase installation. Uh, it's a cluster with 12 machines and that's where we process the graph. And we process the graph to uh, add the information that we infer from the information inference subsystem. So we add the links that were not in the original metadata. But it's also the place where we uh, um, integrate the results of the deduplication subsystem. The deduplication subsystem uh, splits the graph in, uh, let's say, flat collections, uh, for example, the publications, the data sets, the software alone, and performs the duplication within those collections, just trying to identify the objects, the groups of objects that are uh, similar to each other, so equivalent, in fact. So this information is thrown back to uh, the data provision subsystem that uh, creates out of the similar objects one object, which is in fact the uh, representation of all the enrichments that we can collect uh, from the equivalent objects that we had. And that also includes all the links that of course uh, were outgoing the objects that, that we had to merge. So in this way, we respect the topology of, uh, topology of the graph. Uh, we disambiguate it. Uh, because we are providing statistics after all and duplication is a bad thing. And uh, we go on and we produce the dedupe and erase graph. This graph is still uh, resides in a, a HDFS, so in, in a cluster, so it's not really queryable. And from there on, we uh, produce uh, a yet another representation of the graph in different backends, depending on the kind of services we want to provide. For example, we produce uh, uh, a linked open data representation, a uh, full text index representation, which is the one you can access from the portal, uh, an OEIPMH backend uh, is uh, being built, and statistics uh, are built in a dedicated database so that the uh, front end services connect, explore, provide, develop, and monitor can take advantage of this. Uh, even this process is, of course, um, uh, a quite delicate one since we are producing a graph in different backends, uh, and this is really big data. We need to make sure the results in the different backends are aligned, and we also need to make sure that this is like a distributed transaction. So we need to wait for all these processes which are being run in parallel to complete. We need to check the contents inside the different uh, backends is aligned in terms of uh, quantities. And once we are fine, we switch. Basically, everything that is in production goes shadow and everything that is shadows goes in production. Um, we use open source technologies all over the place. We're mainly based in Java. We use Java and, of course, a little bit of Python, a little bit of Perl here and there. It's like reminiscence, but uh, uh, the majority of it is Python. It's uh, about three million lines of code in Python. In uh, sorry, in Java. <laughs> Apologies. Um, I won't stop here very long, but we have a quite quite large infrastructures, and what we hope is that the results of your uh, projects will be integrated here. So you will be probably asked for a further uh, final integration process or either to help us to integrate your results in uh, our production system if these are consistent and uh, consistent and really add, provide added value to what we do. Uh, we are about 40 uh, designers, engineers, developers. So just to give you an idea that it's uh, not a double-click installation system, what we are providing includes also uh, uh, people from the data center we rely on in Poland. Now, uh, quickly on the uh, open science graph. So we are building this big graph uh, thanks to text mining, thanks to harvesting metadata, and thanks to uh, the deposition of objects in Zenodo uh, that Natalia mentioned before. Zenodo is what we call a catch-all repository, so you can store in there software, data set, publications, links between them, associate them to projects, associate them to communities. You can do several very nice things in there. It's open and uh, it ensures pres preservation uh, for the future. So it is key uh, for those who are homeless of a repository like this. And um, uh, it's for free, up to 50 gigabytes, which is very good. If you want to go beyond that, then you have to ask monitor your institution and contact uh, Zenodo. But 50 gigabytes is uh, enough in the majority of the cases. So we build this graph 
uh, we uh, in the in the in the case of harvesting we are trying to do a fine uh, grain uh, collection of content from the original uh, repositories uh, for those who are closer to this uh, kind of um, uh, activities it's uh, simpler to understand but I think is that in general a publication repository is, is consider, uh, considered as regarded in uh, uh, all these aggregation systems as uh, a container of publications this is not really the case so publication can be split in different kinds like data sets software and so on and this is the same for data repositories for example Figshare contains the majorities are data sets but also contains articles so in our uh, aggregation system, uh, we uh, try to fine grain this, make, to make it a, dis a distinction at the fine grain level uh, of the records of this kind of typologies, and this is key to know. Okay, uh, so transformation workflows are basically made of two steps: collection and transformations. So we keep a copy of the native XML, and we we have the cleaned. A version of the XML. The clean version of the XML is the one that then is thrown into the graph. So we have these data collection workflows. Uh, key to know um, is sorry. Key to know is that these data collection workflows are each of them is associated to one specific data source. So we have uh, uh, the uh, history of all the executions of the workflow relative to one given data source. This is very important. So we have the numbers and we can perform sort, sort of quality checks here. So any solution uh, in this kind that may come, come uh, up to your mind is welcome. Um, we are in the process of moving from XML to JSON. So this is something that you have to take into account. XML is quite, uh, is, is, uh, the, the, the lingua franca in the context of repositories, unfortunately, but internally and internally today we have XML for the transformation uh, workflows, but we'd like to move to JSON. So this is again another input you may find, find interesting. Um, and uh, monitoring is key, as I mentioned before. Uh, we track provenance, so we know where each record comes from. We track the IDs of the workflow. We track uh, the types of products we have, and so on. And sometimes um, we lose control of all these things. It's really hard, uh, for example, to detect where an error comes from the granularity of the record. And we have to go back and manually do these things. And this happens, and it takes a, a long time, and it's uh, not really... Um, uh, what we would like to have. So we have in the roadmap these things, but as Natalia said clearly, we cannot implement everything. So this is another suggestion for you. Um, content comes from uh, all possible data sources that are trustful enough uh, out there. And as you can see, what I wanted to highlight here is that we also have um, we, 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 this notion of country and community that we rely on and that uh, we believe is actually key for the kind of services we are providing. So we want to tug uh, the entities in our information space uh, as being part of one or more communities or as being, let's say, uh, attributable, not sure this is an English uh, word, to a country. So meaning that a scientist of that country has provided input to build that product. This is actually key to build aggregation and research impact monitoring services at the level of the nation. So these are uh, two schemes you have to take into account, which are um, um, realized, implemented, they exist already in our, in our graph. So a country is linked to a funder, to a source, to an organization, to a product, and a community is linked to a product, to a project, to a source. And uh, we apply all sorts of propagations of this content, right? So if we know that a source belongs to a country and is, for example, an institutional repository, so it contains objects uh, produced by a scientist of that uh, specific institution, then we can reasonably claim that uh, all objects in that source, all products in that source belong to the same country. So we can explore also this kind of activities. Uh, the duplication, we are uh, running the duplication. These are the kind of numbers we have. Um, we start from uh, hundreds of millions and they go down to much less than this. And this is because we have uh, 
specific criteria for the kind of the duplication we want to apply and also because we have a very uh, uh, high ratio of duplication uh, consider the same author uh, deposits in at least one or two places if you include the publisher and the institutional repository and if it's co-authoring this is multiplied uh, by several co-authors uh, so this is why uh, we reduce the numbers to that level um, the duplication is an issue at the level of the data the software the organization so any solution in this context is more uh, than, than welcome okay <clears throat> mining uh, as i mentioned we have MapReduce on hdfs uh, we where we store these 10 million full text just a full text and we have uh, a rigorous way to accept algorithms that can run on that cluster. So what we are asking you, if you're going to work in this uh, scenario, is to produce an algorithm that is Java-based, that performs text mining uh, um, operations, that provides output that is of interest. You can you can do you can do it on your own uh, test. Uh, uh, working bench benches but then at some point it will have to be integrated in the uh, in the in our in our system and so this requires at least uh, that the algorithm can be easily parallelized for example okay so take that into account when you do your operation uh, there are several things you can do and uh, th these are suggestions of what we do already but it can be done in several other things so we we, we can find the semantic of a link from an object to another, or the, we can identify links from a publication to another object. And any uh, of these actions that brings more content and content that can be used to provide better services uh, is welcome. Uh, context propagation is what I mentioned before. These are just two examples. So how uh, a notion can move from one object to another thanks to the fact that you have relationships between the two that allows to do so. And we have the semantics, which is the one we, we uh, uh, adopted from data side, and we can take this into account in applying context propagation. This is how you can access the graph. Uh, if you go to the to develop.openair.eu, you will find several ways to access it uh, via APIs, via book access, via linked open data. We have also two DOMs, UI Boost and Skull Explorer. So we, you can collect uh, a lot of content. So UI Boost is, uh, spins around the publications in general from Crossref. It's an integration of Microsoft Academics, Unpaywall, Crossref, and ORCID. So it's a big effort. Uh, you can also find the software to do it. You can also find together with the dump. So if you want to uh, take advantage of the software, you're more than welcome. And everything is in Zenodo. Again, you can find everything published there. Um, yeah, I'll share, I'll share with you these slides so this can only help you to better understand. There's, always, there's also a paper describing the content and the software and the data that you can uh, read for your benefit. Skull Explorer is a service that we have built to uh, serve mainly publishers and all those stakeholders uh, around the, the publishers. Uh, we collect links between articles and publications, uh, sorry, articles and data sets and data sets and data sets from publishers, from data centers and so on. We have around 120 million links bilateral, so in both directions. And uh, we have APIs that uh, allow any kind of service, service to uh, quickly uh, resolve uh, the uh, persistent identifiers of this object. This means that if I have the persistent identifier like a DOI of a publication, I can go to the Store Explorer APIs and ask for the uh, objects uh, linked to them together with the semantics. It's based on a standard Scolix, which we Scolix is called, which we uh, have defined together with uh, other uh, people in the domain, and um, it's pretty easy to use and can give you a lot of advantages. And also for Scholar Explorer, we have a dump. Uh, we are going to no, we have just produced a new one. Okay, yes, I can see from the numbers, so you can download it and play with it to build your schemes. So uh, going back now to the services, uh, I gave an overview of the graph, how we build it with some of the open problems, uh, some of the things you can do with it. Of course, you're more than welcome in, uh, yes, I will share the slides, yes. Uh, you're more than welcome in asking more questions by mail to me. Uh, I cannot say everything. And again, as I said before, I might have been 
more uh, specific on one aspect, uh, renouncing another. So please let me know what I can do. So I want to go through quickly on the left side of this picture. So to connect, explore, provide, develop, and monitor. Actually, explore won't be the case. Uh, before I will answer a question from Charles. Charles uh, Letalieu, you said that full texts were extracted from PDF. Are there, no, no, we cannot. This is, uh, we cannot release the uh, full text. Uh, and that's part of an agreement we have the uh, sources that are providing us with um, uh, with the PDFs. Um, you you uh, you can um, what what we can what we can try to do, uh, but this is this will take long probably, is to ask if the the full text that we extract can be shared because they really care about the PDFs. They want to be the only ones. Uh, distributing the PDFs around, and this is very reasonable because they need to count the hits and the downloads. Um, maybe for the full text they can make an exception, but uh, it's a very long process and we cannot uh, really promise anything on this respect because we need to go to them, uh, back to them, and there are hundreds, so <laughs> it's not so obvious. Maybe we can, uh, uh, Natalia, this is a question for you, go through uh, open-minded and see if there's something that we can do there, taking advantage of agreements you already have uh, in the context of this project. But we can um, discuss that afterwards. You're welcome. Uh, another question is, do you take into account references in the publications? Yes, we also extract references from the publication. So for those for which we have the full text, we extract the references. We try to link them to our own objects when this is possible. So we'll also find a link from the, within the reference to an object in our domain. And um, we make them uh, available. We are uh, now in the process of sharing this with Open Citation, the Open Citation graph. Okay, connect. Connect, um, so all these services that we build on the left are basically views of the graph, okay? Views that are driven by the kind of customers we're serving. So connect uh, targets research communities. I won't go into the detail of what a research community is, but consider it as a group of scientists uh, with common interest, uh, scientific interest. Uh, this can be uh, easily identified when we talk about research infrastructures. Uh, I mean, at least it gives us a straightforward uh, definition. It's less obvious when these uh, live uh, beyond the research infrastructures and they're just out there. Uh, in the in the loose, right? So this is not so obvious. But uh, for those that we are serving, uh, often we have a research infrastructures behind, or some kind of strong initiative. And for them, we build views of the graph, uh, where the basic idea is that we are trying to tag objects in the graph uh, based on the pertinence to the community. And we do this automatically. Uh, or, of course, we can do it by uh, having users coming and saying, this object belongs to my community. So you can see screenshots here. Uh, and for example, this is the European Marine Science uh, Research Community. And you can see we have uh, thousands of publications, research data, software, which have been uh, identified as being part or of interest to this community. So this is really about sharing and discovery. Okay. Um, Criteria for inclusion um, can be configured by the administrators of these research uh, community dashboards. They can fine tune our tools to include objects uh, in the view. This can be done by identifying subjects, subjects of uh, known vocabularies, for example, MASH, ACM, DEWEY. Uh, this can be done by provenance, so you can list the data sources that contain objects of that community plus criteria to uh, filter out, schema of the objects that do not belong to the community and are still in the data source. We can uh, provide list of communities in Zenodo. Zenodo organizes uh, its own information space uh, by community. So a community can be created in Zenodo and whenever you deposit an object, you can make it part of that community. Uh, community are uh, different in that in this respects from the one of open air they have the same name this it's not <laughs> simplifies things but um, uh, what you can do in the in an open air resource community dashboard is to specify which are the communities whose objects pertain uh, the original uh, resource community in open air uh, 
Then, of course, projects. You may have projects that are strongly bound to uh, a resource community, and the administrator can list those. So, easily speaking, every object that belongs to or is associated or funded by that project belongs to the community. And then we can also propagate, again, as I mentioned before, via relationships. So a publication that is supplemented by data and software means that if the publication belongs to the community, then the data and the software uh, belong to the very same community. You can, with a supplement by relationship, you can propagate a lot of uh, semantics, of course. Um, the aim of research uh, for research infrastructures here is, uh, which which can use the communities, is to uh, measure impact when we focus only on the objects that have been produced thanks to the existence of the research infrastructure. So this is how useful is the uh, uh, RI for uh, for the world, um, but can also focus, of course, on discovery when uh, this criteria, this constraint, is. Uh, um, uh, lost and uh, we include basically all objects that pertain certain scientific aspects. Um, the funder dashboard. Funder dashboard uh, has to do with monitor and of course serves the needs of the funders and it, th these guys uh, want to know basically how much has been produced, how much has been produced by which project, by which funding stream, when, this is often the case, and especially what's the uh, open access, open science focus of what has been produced. For example, how many research data have been produced, how many of these are open, uh, what's the ratio of linking with publications, for example, which is key to better interpret the data, and the same for software and so on. So these are all aspects that we are trying to monitor. We are serving uh, tens of funders. So you have the list on the right from the uh, uh, for international funders to European funders, and they're queuing, in fact, because the services are very useful. Um, again, funding impact re uh, regards publications, resource data, and so on, published thanks to grants awarded, and open science uh, and open access impact, as I mentioned before. Uh, there are several things that you can do, like trends in research fields, open access versus open science behavior, so ability to attract cross-funder grants and projects, and so on. Again, you can take a look at these slides afterwards. I won't go into the details of this, but these are all open questions that we have in mind and may uh, suggest something to you. Um, provide. Provide uh, is um, toolkit that we have provided, of course, because it's provided for content providers dashboard, uh, for content providers. Content providers uh, need, if they want to give content to open air, need to have a place uh, where they can find everything regarding the, uh, their registration, their activities as, as part of the project. As Natalia said, we're participatory, so we leave thanks to repositories. So repository give us content, we want to give something back in terms of quality of what they have and in terms uh, in general of service provision improvements. So there are four things that we do. Uh, of course they can register, uh, they can validate uh, and monitor uh, the quality of their information. So when we harvest it we can rank the quality uh, of the metadata that we have collected uh, versus um, uh, the open air guidelines that they are supposed to comply to. Uh, we can enrich their content. As I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, we can find information uh, that is uh, important or relevant for the repositories that uh, we can send it back to them. And then we can also, uh, we, have, we are building a framework for uh, user statistics. This is already in place. So repositories can send us statistics about, for example, downloads, uh, visualizations of their content, which we aggregate at the central level in OpenAir. So for an article, we are able to know, for example, how many times has been downloaded across different sources. And this information can again be sent back to the original repository. Um, this is the way the service looks like. Data source registration is there, validation, content enrichment, content notification, and data source usage, which are metrics. Um, no need, no need, no need. Uh, you can take a look at it. 
Okay, you can uh, validate the literature repository, a data repository, or a CRIS system today. These are the three kinds uh, of repositories uh, that we are serving, of data sources, uh, uh, sorry, data sources that we are serving. So if you are the owner of one of those, you can come to OpenAir. Um, if your repository is registered in Open Door for literature repository or re3data.org for data repositories, you can claim you are the repository manager and you can start testing uh, how uh, it, it matches the open air guidelines according to the expectations uh, you can once it's in the process of uh, aggregation check how many times it's been harvested which were the errors that were uh, produced and so on um, and all these kind of services uh, most importantly, you can access the broker, and the broker is again a way to provide information back to the original repositories. Uh, in simple words, what we do, uh, what we do is to, um, uh, for, since we know that a record comes, for example, for repository A, and we collect a, a the same record from repository B, when we deduplicate these two records and we put them together or when we attach to the record extra information that we have mined, for example, a link to a data set and so on, we can easily calculate the diff between the original record in repository A and the rest. So everything that is extra, we can send it back. We create an enrichment event. That's how we call them. We have two kinds of events, uh, more and missing. More means that you already have a value for that specific field, like the open access version, but you don't have the one that we found. Missing instead means that you didn't really have that value and we found one. And these are uh, effectively subscriptions. So you can search the space and see what kind of events we generate for your repository and then you can subscribe to specific ones. And when you do that, we send you emails uh, whenever we generate new content saying, look, this is new for you. If you want, you can go and download it. Okay. For example, links to projects. This is the kind of things or DOIs you don't have or abstracts that you don't have. These are quite common um, uh, information uh, types that we uh, return to the repositories. For the metrics, uh, there's a whole framework for that. You can find information online on the OpenAir uh, website. If you go to provide, you will find it. These are based on standard software that have been that has been devised exactly for that. And you will find any explanation on how to install it, how to participate to what originally was a pilot. Now it's a production service so that repositories or the, 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 the repository platforms that you want to develop or you're maintaining today can be um, equipped with what is necessary to send uh, the uh, statistics to OpenAir. Okay, this is an example for, of statistics, the way we collect them, for example, for this specific repository, how many page views, how many articles, this is an overall view for the uh, for one single repository. But you can have statistics, of course, at the level of the individual records. Um, okay, just forget about this. Uh, I think it's just uh, more information about the kind of events that we have subscription notification oh, okay I think I'm done uh, I have two questions here uh, is resource gate included no resource gate is not included uh, and will not be most likely uh, for say policy reasons in general uh, they tend to be borderline in terms of uh, uh, copyrights and rules and so there's a lot of debate about it which we want to totally avoid and be outside. Uh, are annotations data or literature? Can you be more specific here? What do you mean by so if, if um, what, what, what are the annotations you are referring to Neil? Hello by the way. <laughs> Neil? Oh, you mean as a type? 
it's a type of object. We, we cannot hear you if you're saying something. Yes, Neil, you, we cannot hear you. Uh, but if you if you uh, refer to uh, typology, um, we are not collecting annotations directly. So annotation uh, in a, in a context like open air would be um, attached to the data or the literature, so be external entities, not considered as data or as literature. Then, of course, if you have a collection of annotations that you want to use for your own experiments, you can publish it as a data set. That, that it's always possible. Also, a group of uh, articles, like the full text uh, that we collect, if that would be possible to be published, that would be a data set, of course. But yes, yes, of course. Uh, if you if you publish annotations as uh, as research up output intended as uh, objects that could be processed by experiments, in this case, you would call the collection of annotations. You you would have a data set. You would give it a name. You would publish it wherever you want, so that others can share it and link to it from their articles and so on. Mm, well, no, it, it really depends on the final usage you have in mind. So uh, any object can be considered uh, uh, as belonging to different categories. It just uh, differs the way you published. You publish it. So if you publish it for reading because it's narrative, it's literature, there's nothing bad in doing this. Um, and if you publish it um, for other reasons or you refer to it for other reasons, then you can give it another hat if you want to make sure that your science is repeatable, for example. Um, so it's in general it's much better to make a distinctions in terms of in terms of typology so that your relationship to the object it gets more meaningful or you capture the meaning in the relationship itself but then you're you're making a much more complex space so in this case for example I'd suggest to people to um, to duplicate uh, the, inf the information so to create an object that is literature and an object that is data uh, even though it's the same um, to simplify the way people will access it. Of course, this is tricky. It is tricky in general, but this is not the kind of problems we are trying to solve. It could be, yes, it could be both. Uh, Paolo, just for the record, uh, can you repeat the question? Because I think that um, okay. uh, the, the question just for the people that are going to hear later our recorded uh, oh, discussion. Right. Yes. Here, the yeah. question from Neil was uh, if annotations uh, should be considered research data or literature. And this is a tricky question, of course, and it's, uh, some, it's a problem that comes over and over again. Because, for example, when annotations are part of the text itself, so critical edition, for example, uh, then it's really hard to say if this is literature or data. Um, I would say, in general, this was my reply to Neil, that you, we should, when we publish this kind of information, try to make a clear distinction for those that will reuse it afterwards. So, if your annotations are here to be ex to to be used as input or data to a process, then it's much better if you give them this type. If they are intended for uh, reading for literature, then it's much better to give that kind of type to the point that you may have copies of this, which are different uh, in terms of types and not in, on content. Uh, in general, I would tend to simplify reuse uh, and prefer privilege reuse, but this is not a general rule, so it's just uh, mine and not so uh, relevant opinion. Uh, then another question is how you treat different kinds of open access, gold, green. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, we we don't deal with them explicitly because we have uh, we have uh, access rights in general. So access rights, uh, according to our vocabulary, are quite simple. Are like open, close, restricted, embargo. Okay. Uh, there are combination of things that uh, allow us to draw conclusion on the fact that it is gold and green uh, 
accessing Romeo, for example, which is a service that provides uh, for different journals uh, the kind of license that uh, lay behind the journals. But this is not always obvious. Uh, for our own purposes, we produce statistics of the kind, and it's not obvious because uh, types are mm, misused most of the time. Consider, for example, archive. Archive has preprints and postprints, which would help a lot to make this distinction, but when they export their data, uh, they're just preprints. They don't make any distinction. And we're talking about millions of objects, right? This would really simplify our life. Thank you very much, Paolo, for your presentation. Right. Uh, if there are other questions concerning challenge two and challenge three, I believe that uh, we should answer answer them now, uh, and since you're still here with us. Or if there aren't other questions, then I will make um, Mr. Johan Schirwagen a presenter for the challenge one. Okay, I believe that we are okay. Thank you very much one more time. And um, I will uh, change the presenters now. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I will give an oral presentation and um, I will um, share a summary uh, with you after the call. Um, so I, I have uh, nothing um, to, to share. I don't need to share my, my, my screen. Um, so okay. the the challenge on uh, next generation repositories is actually related to an initiative of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, which established a working group um, almost uh, three years ago, um, with the aim to overcome several issues um, of repositories lacking web-based integration. Um, with other innovative scholarly services. And the goal was to identify new or missing functionalities and technologies in, in the repositories, and also to um, change the focus from repositories as, um, as, as hosts of um, scholarly items um, to the items themselves and to make them more um, web-centric. Um, the idea was also to consider the potential of repositories as a globally distributed knowledge network, um, which can um, proactively help to um, promote the transformation of, of the scholarly communication ecosystem, um, which, which means um, that the, the focus of this challenge is really rather on, on the repository level than um, on the, let's say, traditional um, um, uh, journal level. Um, In the context of um, open air, um, yeah, of open air advance, um, we picked um, um, a few functionalities or behaviors um, based on on the recommendations of this core uh, working group, um, focusing mainly on the aspects of resource discovery, navigation, and, and content transfer. Um, secondly, on um, open metrics um, and um, trying to follow approaches that go that include but also go beyond user statistics um, in order to um, assess the impact of scholarly works and the third aspect um, was on annotation of of content uh, while this was already um, discussed um, or the, the the issue was raised by by neil um, what we mean um, by, by annotation, and, and actually this is a, a more uh, a broader meaning. Um, so originally, um, that annotation will 
an annotation service in open air will be based on results of um, open peer review of comments and uh, also um, um, annotations um, but it could also mean to um, um, let's say to include um, events or activity streams for instance from um, um, social networks um, dedicated to, to uh, researchers. Um, coming to the first aspect of resource discovery, navigation and transfer, um, we are um, still at an early stage here. Um, we focus on two technologies, resource sync and um, signposting. And with regard to resource sync, um, open air implemented a client that can um, connect and collect uh, resources from um, the core um, aggregator in the UK, which has established a, a resource sync endpoint exposing uh, lists of resources about metadata and, and full text links from a few publishers about um, open access journals and articles. Um, in the previous phase of open air, uh, we also had um, an open tender call for services. In this context, um, some platforms um, were supported with an implementation of, of signposting patterns. Um, this was uh, done by, by four signs, um, supporting, for instance, um, OJS versions 2.4 and 3.1. And it was um, supporting signposting patterns um, to um, expose information on, on authors of a publication or, um, or uh, references um, and bibli bibliographic metadata or um, the uh, publication um, uh, boundaries and um, uh, some, some other um, patterns. And there was also an implementation of the resource framework version 1.1 um, for DSpace versions 5 and 6 and an implementation of, um, of the resourcing framework um, for the Samvera um, repository. Um, this is also a reason um, why this challenge suggests, um, especially an implementation of resourcing um, for ePrints, uh, because um, this platform currently lacks um, the support of this framework. Um, but also the implementation of signposting um, for um, the DSpace versions 5 and 6. With regard to open metrics and usage statistics, um, Paolo already um, introduced um, the open air metrics service. Um, however, um, there is still potential to um, improve the service and to improve um, the way the statistics is visualized. Um, regarding this activity, we collaborate here with, with Iris UK, and <coughs> you, um, which are using um, their own um, tracking service and, and, and tracking protocol. And in open air, we are using um, the Matomo um, analytics service. And this has the um, effect that we actually following um, a different um, a tracking protocols and, and also the, it requires um, dedicated plugins um, for different software platforms. Um, we want to overcome this, this issue by aligning these tracking protocols and also to provide uh, a more generic tracking um, plugin to reduce effort of implement implementation and maintaining of this plugin for many different software platforms. Um, 
the OpenAI user statistics service is able to track usage events um, from individual um, repositories, but uh, also open access journals like OJS, or alternatively to collect um, counter reports. Um, we currently support um, regarding the cleaning of usage events, the um, counter code of practice release four, and are planning to support release five and counter for research data um, in the next few months. And the statistics is not only um, represented in, in the portal on the level of data sources or on the um, article or item level, um, but also exposed uh, via Socialite API endpoint. And we count at the moment about 70 um, data sources we track and around 80 um, repositories where we gather counter reports from Iris UK. Um, still, there is the need to uh, scale up the service and to uh, promote it more and to include um, more um, data sources to participate in usage statistics. Um, one approach uh, which in our side would make the life a little bit easier is if it's possible to establish um, statistics nodes on, on a national or regional level Examples are the IRIS nodes in, in the UK, in uh, Australia, USA, New Zealand. And also we collaborate with La Referencia on um, establishing um, a user statistics node in Latin America. And then the idea is to connect and share user statistics via those regional um, nodes. Another aspect uh, quite important is to um, support user statistics also in other infrastructures in the um, uh, European Open Science Cloud. And then what I mentioned as one issue is to identify um, or to support different techniques and methods of visualization of usage data. Um, this can be done in different contexts, for instance, to visualize statistics um, on, the, on the item or work type, um, relate to author networks, um, to relate statistics on um, different topics uh, on the level of data sources or countries. Um, another idea is to um, in order to go beyond user statistics to integrate with, with um, other kinds of, of metrics and alternative um, indicators. Um, one example is um, <clears throat> what could be of benefit is the integration with the open citation data, um, but also with alternative indicators uh, once they are related to scholarly context. Um, the problem here is um, that it requires um, that we not only show, um, let's say, the number of, of, of tweets or mentions, but also to provide um, a certain context in order to interpret um, this kind of, of event. So, okay, um, are there any, any questions so far? If uh, <clears throat> there aren't um, any questions from the participants, then uh, we can proceed to uh, additional comments if the, the presentation of Challenge 1 is completed. Then, and if there are no questions, we can proceed to additional comments from other Challenge Champions.
I believe this is Neil because uh, it's the the sound when the microphone is open. You can always write to us, Neil, if uh, because you, we can't hear you. So I can see that so far there are no questions. So are there any additional comments from other challenge champions? Okay. Um, I will take it I will take this as a no. So, um, Johan, you have something else to add from your part? Uh, no. Okay, so um, I can thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And um, just to, to complete this session, um, I will just state uh, a, a general um, some things concerning the framework of the open air PCP call for tender, just for the participants to, to have a small idea of the general procedure. Uh, PCP uh, means that public procurers um, challenge innovative players on the market uh, via an open, transparent and uh, competitive process to develop uh, new solutions for a um, technologically demanding mid to long term challenge that is, in, um, that is in the public interest and requires new R&D services. So we chose this form of the call of a tender because um, um, it um, uh, gives more space to uh, R&D services to be developed. Uh, the, the, the PCP uh, incorporates solution design, uh, prototyping, original development and testing. Uh, you can uh, thoroughly see through uh, in our text the, the phases that um, you will follow. And uh, if you have already visited our site, you can see that there are also some annexes that you have to complete together with uh, your proposal. Uh, here uh, you can see the deadline for the submission. Uh, I just want uh, for you to know that you can send your proposals and the annexes at um, openair at coralia.org by email. And um, I have received some questions uh, so far concerning the form of um, uh, of these annexes. Uh, so just for your information, I can tell you that uh, it is not necessary for you to complete all of them. You just have to see which are the annexes that are suitable with um, uh, the form of your team. And then you can complete uh, the one that uh, concern, concern your profile. Uh, you have the deadline. And um, it is important for you to, to, to clarify the, the form of your team. That means that, for example, if you're not a company yet and you're a natural person, if, uh, but you're in process to register your company uh, following the administrative procedure of your country, it is important that before the deadline, the registration, for example, of your company is completed. That means that if you have a question uh, if you have to submit your proposal either as a natural person or as a legal person, then it is important for you to, to know that um, the form of your team, uh, it, it has to be compatible with the form, um, with the status, uh, with your status as an economic operator the day of um, the submission of the proposal. Um, if you have uh, other questions concerning uh, technical or, or strategic points, you can address um, you can address your questions to us now. And uh, before your question, one more tip uh, concerning the, the registration of um, concerning the registration of this model, uh, Panos, you want to tell us? 
Yes, hello. Uh, so this uh, session is recorded, uh, as well as you know, uh, and it will be available uh, in the open air course in the Moodle uh, of Coralia. Uh, so you can uh, you will be able to find it there along with other useful material that uh, it has been collected and will be useful for you to um, get back to in order to understand more of open air uh, in general. Uh, also, you will be able to uh, contact us through there as well for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Panos, for your comment. I can see here that we have a question. I will just read it for uh, um, the minutes of this meeting. So, the deadline is really tight and unfortunately um, placed on a Sunday, which is a public holiday throughout the European Union. May I suggest moving the deadline forward a few days to facilitate wider participation in the call? So, uh, this is uh, actually the second time that we're receiving this question. Uh, so, uh, I suggest that um, we will have an internal meeting tomorrow in order to discuss this possibility. So, I won't give you a formal um, answer now uh, but uh, all the participants of this call you will receive a, a formal response tomorrow to these questions because we really need to to be fair and to meet your needs uh, concerning uh, the pcp call for tender so uh we will we'll discuss it and you will receive um a formal reply tomorrow and uh, also we'll publish this if we have if we're going to have a change to change the date and uh, then we'll publish it also online uh, at the website of open air Uh, so, from uh, my side, there are no more comments. I would like to ask one more time if there are uh, comments, um, suggestions, remarks from your side, either from the side of the Challenge Champions or from the side of the participants. And if there aren't, then we can uh, close the meeting. Okay, I believe there are no more questions or comments. So I would like to thank you one more time for your participation. I would like to thank the Challenge Champions for their comments and for their detailed presentations, the participants for your questions. And uh, we will talk again tomorrow uh, in order to inform you what we're going to do uh, concerning the, the deadline of the Open Air Advanced PCP call for tender. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.